are here on this Memorial Day in America, remembering those who have given their lives in service to our nation. How many? Since the start of the American Revolution, 1,315,000 Americans have died in military conflict operations here in this nation. And so we remember. In Gettys, at Gettysburg in 1863, President Lincoln reminds us that through their deeds, speaking of those who died in that great battle, the dead had spoken more eloquently, he said, for themselves than any of the living ever could. And where the living can only honor them by rededicating ourselves to the cause for which they so willingly gave a last full measure of devotion. President Ronald Reagan said in his Memorial Day speech at the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier in 1984, a grateful nation opens her heart today in gratitude for their sacrifice, for their courage, and for their noble service. Indeed, we should express and have already and should tomorrow as well our gratitude for those whose own lives ended on a foreign battlefield in foreign skies and in a distant ocean somewhere else. Now, if anybody in America should understand and should appreciate, respect those who gave their lives so that others might enjoy life, it should be those of us who bear the name Christian. Jesus taught us this, did He not? And so today, I want us to think about the subject, remember how we got here. Think about the sacrifices that have been made for us to be where we are today, how God has both provided for this nation and protected this nation using young men and women to defend this nation. The text is John 15, verses 12 through 14. Would you turn there, please? John 15, 12 through 14. And turning there, let's look at the words of Jesus, who said, this is my commandment. Jesus is giving this commandment with his authority that you love one another as I have loved you. Look at the next verse. Greater love has no one than this, that someone lay down his life for his friends. And then, you are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, looking back at verse 13, he described great love by laying down one's life for one's friends. As we enjoy national freedom as a country still, by God's grace, let us also give God glory for the spiritual freedom as Christians that we enjoy ourselves, that are a part of every breath we take and has been since we were born again. Now, in John chapter 15, let me set the stage for you what is happening. It is the final discourse that Jesus has with his disciples. The cross is only a few hours away. It is coming quickly. And so, Jesus begins telling his disciples the things that will be so important that they should hold on to after he has died and after he has risen, after he's ascended and has returned to heaven. Back in John chapter 13, verse 1, Jesus said, Now before the feast, or the Bible says, Now before the feast of the Passover, Jesus, knowing that his hour had come, that he should depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in this world, he loved them to the end. Even though at times they disappointed him, they frustrated him, Jesus never did stop loving his disciples. And so now what does he do? He commands his disciples that they should not stop loving each other. Having received him as Messiah, having soon, soon to be understanding him as the risen Lord, Jesus said, don't stop loving each other. You've been set free to follow me. You've been set free to live for me. I've come that you might have life, Jesus said in John 10, 10, and that you might have it more abundantly. You are free 
by God's grace to enjoy eternity together with him. And then he says, you're also free to love others as I have loved you. Do you realize that your love as a Christian is a freedom that God provided for you when Jesus died on the cross, when you were born again, and when the Holy Spirit came into your life and into your heart and dwells within you this very moment. You are not asked to do the best you can when it comes to loving others. No, you are asked to allow and let God himself love others through you. We are free indeed to live and to love like Jesus. Notice number one, the example of freedom. Look at verse 12. The example of freedom. This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now, Jesus knows that the cross is coming, and so Jesus is making it very clear that he is the example of which they are to follow, that, that this is we've been made free in Christ as his disciples, free to live for him, free to live like him, and free to love others in his name. And I know what we're thinking. Boy, sometimes things are just easier said than done, don't we? And love, as a Christian, is one of those words that's so easy to say and yet so hard to do at times. And yet Jesus makes it very clear that the church is supposed to be a place where the world can see what real love looks like. Uh, in the early church, there was something, uh, it was something that the world had ever seen before, and that was the love of God. You had people from all walks of life and all kinds of backgrounds coming together and displaying mutual love and respect, esteeming each other better than themselves, helping each other, serving together in a way that the world was completely unfamiliar with. Things at that time like tribalism, racism, legalism, materialism, sexism, religion, politics, slavery, economics, what citizenship you had, from what kingdom or nation you came from, and on and on we could go. Countless things that divided the people. Sound familiar? And yet the church stood in stark contrast to these very things. Now, notice that Jesus is giving us His commandment. This is my commandment that I'm giving you. When you read the Gospels, you'll see almost 400 different commands of the Lord Jesus for those who follow Him, those of us who are His disciples. Uh, for instance, we, we end each morning service by saying one of the commands of Christ, the Great Commission, to go into all the world and preach His gospel. And then there's the command, as He repeated from the Old Testament, the greatest command, to love the Lord your God with all your heart, mind, soul, and strength. And then the commandment here in our text, to love one another. You know, we don't have a problem with the first part of that command, do we? That you love one another? Hey, who wants to go around and being a hater? Hey, yeah, I love one another, especially folks I go to church with. But that's not the part of the verse that gives us hesitation, is it? No. What causes us to swallow hard is the last part of the verse. Love one another as I have loved you. Now, remember who's telling us this. This is Jesus. This is His commandment. And, and how do we... How do we love each other as Jesus has loved us? Well, we understand it's a command. It's not a suggestion. It's not, an, it's not just an idea. It's a command. It's meant to be obeyed. And if God commands us to do something, he gives us the ability to do something. But it's not us in our own weakness doing it. It is Jesus through us in the person of the Holy Spirit. Now, I know this close to Mount Airy, we have a few Andy Griffith fans in the congregation this morning. As you know, your pastor is one. Do you remember the episode, Mr. McBeavy? Remember that episode? 
What a great episode. 1962, Mr. McBeavy. And uh, I love that line towards the end of that program when Barney says, Andy, surely you don't believe that, 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 that Mr. McBeavy exists. And he says, no, no, I can't say I do, but I believe Opie, my son. You see, Mr. McBeavy was someone that was a telephone repairman. Remember back in the ice ages when we had telephone repairmen? They drove around the little trucks, you know, and they'd, they'd climb up poles and, and keep our telephones working. You remember that time? Well, Mr. McBeavy was one of those. And Opie was describing things about him that really from a child's perspective were, were accurate. And yet from an adult, you're thinking, how in the world could these things be true? And you remember the scene in the program where Andy's in the woods at the end of the show and he calls out Mr. McBeavy and you hear this voice from above, yes, and he starts climbing down the pole and Andy looks up and how's he climbing down the pole? He's got these big spikes on his work boots as all telephone repairmen had and then he had a belt, a climbing belt. Now, once you climb up that pole, how do you climb down it? Well, if you simply hug that thing, you're going to get a bunch of splinters. It's not going to be a lot of fun. You climb down by leaning back against the belt. And as you climb down leaning against the belt, you make your way safely to the ground. You know, a lot of us haven't learned how to lean in on Jesus. We haven't learned how to lean in on God's Word. We haven't learned how to lean back on God's power or lean back on God's love, and we keep getting spiritual splinters, as it were, in our lives, and we will continue to do so until we come to the place where we fully trust God and are able to lean back on Him. Notice the next verse. We see the expense of freedom. The expense of freedom. The Bible says, greater love has no one than this, that someone laid down his life for his friends. The expense of having the freedom to love others means it will make your flesh uncomfortable. You might be misunderstood. Your love might be accused of as being hate by a world that hated Christ. Now remember who our ultimate example is of what it's like to pay the expense of freedom to love like him, and that's Jesus himself. Jesus wanted them to remember that when they would see him on the cross, he was doing that for their sake. And, and it's by the example of loving others that the world looks at the church and realizes that something is incredibly different about those people who call themselves Christians, or yet they should. And yet how unfortunate and disappointing to God it must be when we are so quick to falter when it comes to loving each other and instead showing a world greater respect, greater love, greater kindness, greater patience than we show brothers and sisters in Christ, a world that hates Jesus and still hates Him today, and yet acting in a way that is hurtful toward those whom have been bought by the blood of Christ just like us. Jesus didn't say to the disciples, love the world as I've loved you. Jesus said, love each other as I have loved you. Love one another. Go back in verse 12. What, well, what, who are the one another's? Not those who were not following Jesus. The one and others are those who were following him. And here's the point Jesus is making. You cannot hate each other and then consider yourself to be my friend. John emphasizes this truth in his letter in 1 John chapter 4, verse 20. If someone says, I love God and hates his brother, he is a liar. For the one who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him that the one who loves God should love his brother also. Now, we're living in strange times. Strange times when, when, when Christians are accused of in standing for righteousness, in standing for what God says in his word, uh, in, in loving others but not affirming their sinful choices, that somehow we're the ones guilty of hate. We've all seen the T-shirts and banners and signs from protesters and lobbyists 
demanding and marching and saying that love, not hate. It's a redefining of love. What's interesting is, is in their position, there is great hate being shown. It is okay to love someone and yet understand and not approve and realize that what that person is doing is sinful. It's harmful. It, it goes against what the Scripture says. But the implication is by the world that unless we diminish our view that the Bible is authoritative, uh, unless we step away from the idea that the Bible has absolute moral authority in our lives, then we are somehow guilty of hating someone because we are not approving and affirming of everything that they're doing. Parents, has your kid ever said, I hate you? Hmm? Well, maybe for some, in a fit of rage and anger, because they don't like what you're doing, but does that mean because they don't like what you're doing and not affirming in what they want to do that you love them any less? Not at all. Here's the thing we need to understand where the world is today. Their argument is this, as would ours be if we were still in our sins and lost. Life is about me. Life is about me. That's the message of the world. And yet as Christians, when you read the Scripture, we understand in the words of Christ and in wherever God's Word speaks to life, that life is not about us. Life is about God. And if we're to show others this truth, then does it not stand to reason that we should be faithful to the ways of Jesus? That we should avoid biblical compromise? That we should demonstrate to others that we're genuinely and fully in love with God and with Christ, our Savior? That we are determined to live Christ-like in our own lifestyles? And as we've sung before, the little chorus, they will know we are Christians by our love. It's really simple. Love God, love people, and then hate sin. Uh, that's what we ought to do. Not the sinner, but even sin in our own lives. See, the church should be the place where the world can see love most clearly in us because as we are the friends of Jesus, so we should display Jesus' love for each other and to the world in a way that catches their attention and they understand something is different. Now, keep in mind that when it comes to this whole idea of, of friendship, I've got something else I want to say about it in just a moment. Remember that, that the friendship that, that Jesus is talking about uh, is an example of what he has done in sacrificing for them. And as we're going to see in a minute, that sometimes it is really challenging to be a friend, is it not? Uh, do you have a friend that it's hard to be a friend for? Uh, is friendship simply only something that's always easy? Well, of course not. When we experience the freedom that Jesus has purchased for us, God's indescribable gift of everlasting life, how can we ever hope to love the world as we should if we've not first come to the one who has loved us so perfectly? The Bible says in Romans 5, 8, God shows his love for us in that while we're yet sinners, Christ died for us. Well, what about the expertise of freedom? The expertise of freedom, freedom to live, freedom to love. How do you become an expert at that? experiencing that which God has provided for us in Christ. Now, now notice, here's the question. Look what, look what the last verse says. You are my friends if you do what I command you. Now, this is important. Listen to this. You are my friends if you do what I command you. What does that mean? That means if we come to the place where, where we are obeying God, then we are friends of the Son of God. Now, now that doesn't mean 
you know, the little chorus, I'm a friend of God, I'm a friend of God, I'm a friend of God, he calls me friend, as if there's really nothing uh, obligatory in that statement. What Jesus is saying right here has tremendous responsibility, tremendous impact, uh, tremendous power in these words. Uh, you see, as a servant, there are a couple of types of servants in Jesus' day. There's one servant that's nothing but an instrument, a tool for the master to get things done. You would never invite that kind of a servant into your presence and um, give him close communion and fellowship. But then there was the other servant who was almost at times like a member of the family. Uh, literally, the word friend that Jesus uses means friend of the court, friend of the court of the king, and that's what he's talking about. Uh, a slave could be abused, beaten, sold, mistreated, even killed if the master saw fit. But he's describing a different type of servant, a different type of slave. A slave, a servant that is close, that is faithful, that is humble. And the last thing a slave would have been um, in this situation is unfaithful to the master who trusted him so much. He is saying that we are welcomed and we enjoy the close fellowship of personal friendship as slaves in the court of the king of kings when we do as he said. And what was to be the condition of this friendship? That you do what I command you. So to be a friend of Jesus means that we have an obligation. An, an obligation of what? An obligation of obedience. An obedience meaning love. Not a love that goes along and affirms everything that everyone wants us to, but a love that is based and focused on Christ and overflows to brothers and sisters in our family of faith and then causes us to treat others with respect and to realize that the thing the world needs to hear is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Not arguments, not debates, but the good news of the love of God offered and found only in Jesus Christ. And once someone comes to know Christ, then the process of sanctification comes along behind. The journey of discipleship comes after that. But first there comes to that point where they must understand and realize that God has saved them because they have received His Son, Jesus Christ. What an amazing, miraculous truth that people like you and I can be the friends of God, that we can be the friends of Jesus. The mark of the Christian life, according to Francis Schaeffer back years ago, wonderful apologist and writer, he said the mark of the Christian, his book entitled The Mark of the Christian, it's one word, it's love, even if it hurts, even if we're misunderstood, even if we're hated, even if we're cast out, if, even if we suffer. You might say, well, I can't love him, her, or them. My friend, if God said you can, you can. Because it's not you doing it anyway. You might have to pray that through. You might have to fast and pray. You might have to wrestle with it. Hide God's word in your heart. Bring God's word to your mind. And when you have that choice to respond in a way other than in love to that person, then you have to lean on Christ and let him love them through you. It's not a question of can I when God says we should. It's a question of will I. The Bible says in Ephesians chapter 5, beginning verse 15, look carefully then at how you walk, not as unwise but as wise, making the best of the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. So how are you doing this Memorial Day? When it comes to living in the freedom that God has given to us in Christ. How are you doing this Memorial Day when it comes to living in the, the kind of life that says to others, that must be what it's like to be a Christian? Do you have someone in your life that has loved you unapologetically, unconditionally, faithfully, as Jesus has loved you? Then you are blessed. Are you seeking to be that kind of a friend of Jesus that you will have that impact and influence with somebody else? We talk about the freedom that we enjoy as a nation because of those who have died for us. What about the freedom we enjoy as believers because of God who has died for us in the person of His Son? 
We talk about faithfulness and courage as soldiers of this nation. What about soldiers of the cross whom we have called to be? Do you realize that more Christians have been martyred for their faith in the last, since in the 20th century than all the centuries before combined in the history of the church? And most of those died under communism and socialism. There will be Christians today, very likely, that will die simply because they're followers of Jesus. But when you love Jesus, you want to love others as Jesus loved them, even if in doing so, people accuse you of being hateful and seek to harm you or take your life. Do you think he regrets what he did? Do you think any Christian martyr is in heaven today and sorrowful for their faithfulness and obedience and suffering for Christ? No. And so the question for us is, if we have victory in Christ and freedom from the authority of sin in our life, freedom to live in the fullness of the Holy Spirit and to love others like Jesus has loved us, starting first in the church and then spreading out our families and friends and wherever we might go and whoever we might meet. Can there be any good reason for us telling God, no, that's too much, I can't, when in reality, choosing not to love is simply because we've said, I won't. Aren't you glad Jesus didn't tell the Father that when the cross was in front of him? May we be faithful on this Memorial Day Sunday. Thankful for not only the freedom we have in the nation, but for the freedom we have as Christians in Christ, including not only freedom to live like Jesus, but freedom to love like Jesus. If you want to know more about what it means to have Jesus as your advocate, then call or contact us using the information on your screen. We want to help you to know and receive Jesus Christ today as your personal Lord and Savior. If you live in the Roanoke Valley but don't belong to a local church, then I would personally like to invite you to worship with us next week in person right here at First Roanoke. Our Sunday morning services are at 9 a.m. and 10.30 a.m. and our college and young adult service is at 6 p.m. May God bless you and your family today by His grace and for His glory.